Hello, traders, and uh, welcome to this edition of the Coach's Playbook. We just got done hearing about the uh, juvenile antics of a young <laughs> John Hoagland. Uh, that's a story that we'll go into at some time. <laughs> but anyway, we're not talking about uh, John Hoagland's hijinks today. We're talking about the keys to consistent profitability. Uh, this is something that was brought up in honor of our uh, dear friend, risk manager, Mick Ironimo, and uh, he's okay. Don't worry, guys. Uh, he's getting married, so he's out. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so exciting for him. So, congrats, Mick. Congratulations to Mick. But he's a big uh, person about achieving consistent weekly profitability. So, we thought we'd talk today about a few keys to doing that. So, uh, but before we do that, since Mick's not here, Dan, I thought you could throw out a couple of our traders who deserve a shout out. Absolutely. We got Rebecca. Um, Rebecca W. She's up, and these are just today. She's up 23, 16. At the moment, it may have changed since we've clicked in, but she was up quite a bit of money, $2,316, trading some equities. Taking advantage of the short side and long side there. Um, and then Peter, uh, Peter T is up 1,200 right now. He's actually in a current active position, um, taking a nice run on that. He's uh, got two contracts on and uh, getting paid nicely. So hopefully he's able to lock in some of those profits here today. And, very uh, nice, very nice. Oh, that's that's amazing. I've been in a uh, meeting all morning. Were the equities moving today? Um, yeah, they had put, new, highs. put in some new highs, a uh, big move right after the open to the upside. So mm -hmm. a lot of opportunity out there. All right. Well, uh, as we talk about consistent profitability, I thought a good place to start, and we've pounded away on this a few times before, is putting the process before the profitability. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's one of the most important things. We have to get our mind away from that P&L. Forget about how much money we are making or losing. This is trading. Both are going to happen. If you haven't lost yet, you're going to. It's inevitable. Um, so for me, I think it's all about taking the time to focus on how you're getting into the market, how you're getting out of that market, making sure it's the same every single time to focus on that process. Forget about how much money you've made in that trade or in the past or lost in the past. Start to focus on really that system, that strategy that you have defined and honed over time so that you can then allow the profits to start to show themselves. Take a look at that at the end of the day. Don't worry about it in the middle of the day. Know that you have certain amount of risk that you can risk. Maybe it's a couple losses. Maybe it's $500. Obviously, you have to keep an eye on it, but really focus on your system each and every day. It's, I think, one of the major paradoxes of trading is if you're focused on the money, you will never find it. You really, truly have to focus on the process. Uh, if you are placing goals financially uh, on a daily basis or a weekly basis or even time-based goals, I want to get to the next level by such and such a date, you're really kind of push, putting yourself at risk of abandoning your process and, uh, uh, and pu pushing yourself away from staying in your process if you're not reaching those financial or time-based goals. It's more about staying in your process, focusing on making good trading choices, choices that are going to be in your best interest. Even if it's a loss, as long as it's in your process, you're still acting in your best interest. So, uh, you know, focusing on prof profit on process over profit is step one, if you ask me. It's something I talk to uh, my, my performance coaching uh, family too. Uh, and uh, very, very important is to, if you focus on the money, you will never find it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't know if I've told this story before on the playbook, but, um, and I'm not sure I can even recommend this advice to people that are in a trading combine because you do have, you know, you have very strict loss limits, but some food for thought. The best outright trader that I knew would actually close his P&L monitor uh, whenever he was trading. All he'd be looking at was the position he had on mm -hmm. and just would not at all until the end of the day look at how much money he made. I mean, obviously, sometimes you have to look at it if you, you can see if you get huge slippage or something. You should always have an idea, even without seeing your P&L, of mm -hmm. what you have on, how much you're up, how much you're down. Mm -hmm. And that was just the way he did it. It was completely process. The money flows from that. Absolutely. That's what we used to do when I was trading options. No one paid attention to the P&L. You obviously have an idea of how your position's doing, how your trading has been. You keep that 
kind of rolling tally within your head, but no one, we didn't even run a PL number until settlements posted after we were out of, uh, out of our positions or we were at least covered to cover us through the, the night. We never checked PL. We just knew where we stood on the day. Can I tell a, a kind of a funny story? Yeah. Yeah, only if it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a, a really big trader in the S&Ps and his clerk was a friend of mine and I'm standing in the pit, you know, talking to this clerk who was a friend of mine and this, you know, big successful trader is standing there and he's just watching the market, watching the market, watching the market. And uh, he leans over to his clerk and says, what's my position? <laughs> and Steve says, 80. And he stands back up, looks around and goes, long or short? <laughs> I was floored. I'm thinking, are you kidding? You've got 80 big S&Ps on. You're not sure if you're long or short. That's focusing on the process, I would, I would guess. <laughs> not for everybody, but for him, that was part of his process, was just being able to flow with the market, not have expectations, or even the knowledge of his position at times. Which I think is kind of interesting, because at the end of the day, all he cared about was each and every trade that was coming his way. Mm -hmm. He knows that every trade he's making is within his system. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whatever his position is, is irrelevant in a sense obviously that's why he's got a clerk to say if the market about turns takes off the other way and he can go remember you were long 80. right right, right let's get out right. of that let's get out of that right. well you know what i'm gonna do in the spirit since it's such a good uh segue here i'm gonna flip around points two and three here okay okay so we're gonna talk about identifying goals and i think that this especially when you take like a weekly time frame or something like that the stories you're telling about the process by following a process like that, you can make sound decisions about what your goals should be and how big you can trade and do that confidently. And that's how you work your way up the trading 80 big S&Ps and not worrying about it mm -hmm. is because you are so confident in what your goals are and what you have done mm -hmm. that you can do it. And it's just a multiple, you know, 10%, 20% more than what you traded successfully the week before or the month before. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, you were, you yeah, were, so we're talking, talking about, about the un uncertainty, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. What, what I'm talking about here is like identifying goals, all right? You identify going out like what you want your, what, what you deem to be successful going out, all right? And a good way to track that, and this Got is it. what Mick was talking about, is like having a consistent weekly profit goal. Right. Because the weekly profit goal is a large enough time frame with a large enough sample size that you can, if you are being consistently profitable like that, it shows you're doing something right. It's also a small enough sample size, mm -hmm. right, that you're not seeing the market change completely usually in those right. time frames. Absolutely. John and I were actually just talking about this before we got, mm -hmm. got on air, and he yeah. made a good point about it that I figured you could touch on there. Um, uh, didn't I, I kind of already talked about the, the, the kind of financial goals? And yeah, the, but like what you said to me that kind of resonated was <laughs> we, we, the bullet point we have written down is weekly gains versus lower time frame gains. John even went a step further to say, forget that weekly term and put it in terms that can work for you. Mm. Um, and I think what is so important about that is not thinking about it in the sense of this was always the thing that really has stuck with me that has been taught my whole career was don't ever let one trade or one day make or break you as a trader. You sure. can never rely on that one day. So as you grow over time, how do you become profitable at this? And you, you even sometimes for people to set that weekly profit goal, that can be really difficult because maybe you're down coming into Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. You're now mm -hmm. thinking about that fact that, well, my goal is to be profitable by the end of the week. For sure, three down days, two up days, yeah. you should be able to recover, yeah. but not always the case. So you uh, you size up and you start trading outside your strategy right. to, just so you can try and make that goal. You know, uh, for one of the, my goals for the people that, I, that I'm that i involved with in, in coaching is to help them find sustainability. And sustainability is first risk management, of course, but if you can maintain an account and build an account over a long period of time, uh, that's you know that's managing your expectations. That's trading within your within you within your abilities. But when you are able to maintain that account over time, you're buying the time to get better and better at understanding how markets work, understanding how you work, and you and it does take some time. So if you you know if you have this big goal of you know making X amount in, in a certain period of time. You got to start, you got to crawl before you can walk, before you can run, so, right? John, Dan, I have a, like a two-part question that I think okay. goes into this, all right? 
So part one is what kind of goals did you guys set when you're trading? Or when you are trading, what goals do you set? And uh, second, I got to think about this for a second, is the goals you set. And then how do you decide when you're going to size up or size down? Do you have a consistent way that you do that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with this one, John. Go ahead. Uh, first off, one of my biggest goals, I wasn't really looking at it on a weekly standpoint. Um, to me, I looked at it as I started looking at it and going, okay, there are thir let's just take 30 days in a month or 20 trading days in a month. How much do I have to make in those 20 days to, be, to make my bills for next month? I needed to keep it really simple, understanding how much it costs me each and every day to survive. When you start breaking it down, it gets pretty cheap to survive and how you can do it. And so I looked at it and saying, instead of even saying at the end of the week, I need to be here, it was more or less at the end of the month, this is a goal. But if I cannot achieve that goal, what's my biggest amount of risk I can take? And so I had a risk goal of saying, look, at the end of the month, I'm mm. not going to lose more than this. Mm. Obviously, every month we want to show you know, positive numbers every month. That's not always going to be the case in trading. So I had my risk goal. I won't risk more than this. And I have just that profit idea of where I need to be to survive so I can continue to trade. And that's how I looked at it. I didn't look at extracurriculars. I strictly looked at what I needed to survive and what I needed to do to make it. Once I hit that number, if it was maybe the first day of the month, first week of the month, didn't really matter. Once I hit that number, I really started to slow down my aggressive trading and I really focused on that a setup, the high probability setups, and that's led me to some really great months over time. Yeah, and as far as like knowing when to size up or when to size down, I think a lot of that is direct, directly related to the distance in price as to where the, your um, point of invalidation is. If hmm. you're really close mm -hmm. to your point of invalidation, you may be able to add another contract or two and use this, use kind of that same risk as if you, you're further away from your point of invalidation for a trade. Of course, uh, volatility uh, leaks into that as well. If you're in a volatile situation, you're going to need more risk. You're going to want to size down. Uh, less volatile situations, range bound, you're, go you're probably going to have more defined points of invalidation for your trades. You trading close to those points of invalidation might give you the opportunity to size up. And that's just in position sizing overall. As far as you know, finding consistency, learning to trade, trading one or two contracts, building your account that way. As you build your account, again, you're building confidence, knowledge, the ability to know yourself. Over time, you can start to add to those, add to those positions. Again, it goes from you're crawling to walking to running to flying. Absolutely. And just one thing to even add on to that, um, I always look at sizing up versus sizing down kind of as the market. We always talk about the market takes the stairs up, the elevator down. I will let, I will size up very, very slow. And as soon as I start to struggle or maybe have a couple of bad days that I took some bigger losses, I'm very quick to say, okay, bring it back to one. Mm -hmm. Let's get comfortable here mm -hmm. and then work myself back up again. It's it's a never revolving. You cycle. have to size down far quicker than you size Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah, J just by you know mathematically think about it. If you keep sizing up, a few of those bad days are going to wipe out oh, <laughs> that yes. whole thing while you're sizing yes. up. Absolutely. And that's never happened to me. <laughs> no. <laughs> and another thing, it's a complete ego thing too, because as we talk a lot about managing emotions and stuff like that, sizing down is one of the hardest things you have to do because so many people sort of peg their uh, value as a human being to the amount of size that they're putting out in the sure. market. Oh, totally. And once you're a big trade, once you trade that size, it's so hard to let go and say, well, I'm going to cut it down. Mm -hmm. you know? It's not an easy thing to do. And it's, a, it's a consistency in, in the ability to correctly hypothesize the current market state too. You know, if you're, if you're hot that way, if you're able to recognize the current market state, great. If you're having trouble, even on a day when you're not feeling at your best, maybe you're tired, maybe somebody upset mm -hmm. you, uh, maybe you're hungover, uh, maybe something <laughs> is going on in your life that is distracting you, that's a good time to really st think about sizing down because you're putting yourself at greater risk at any time that you are kind of discounted in your ability to, to read the market well. Absolutely. Yeah, the market doesn't care about your ego. That's no. Not at all. <laughs> so, and then uh, one other thing, and I think this applies sometimes when you're up going into things, is we have here to make things realistic. And Dan, you talk about this a lot. This is sort of like your uh, strike zone, Absolutely. your wheelhouse. Absolutely. If you have worked with me or heard me or watched any videos with me, chances are you've heard me talk about the cable bill. 
It is the biggest thorn in my side. I refuse to even have the thing set to auto pay so I can feel the pain every single month paying that cable bill. My cable bill right now is $218 a month. I hate it. Comcast? I have Comcast. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you really want to do it, I have actually two cable bills, so I have another one for my house in Wisconsin. So I really hate my cable bill. <laughs> but I pay it every month, and for me, it is, it's not a huge number at the end of the day. Compared to any other bill I have, it's not one of the biggest, um, but it's the thorn in my side. Strictly because, to me, when I see a $200 profit in a trade, a lot of times I can get lost in looking at that number. To me, sometimes when the market is moving, S&Ps move 30, 40 points, $200 is just a small little fraction. But anytime I see a profit of $200, you know what pops up in my head? The cable bill. The cable bill. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, it's a luxury, but it's something that I'll always want to have as my cable. And so when I see positive $200, anytime that market starts to turn back on me, I have to recognize what that cable bill really is. <laughs> and if I go from 200 up to 200 down, you know what that costs me? Two months of cable. No, Dan says, uh, level two down here says $12 for Netflix for him. All right, we can't all be cord cutters. I, <laughs> I appreciate your frugality. But keep in mind, you're still paying for the internet. And I, I mean, it, there's so many different things. And um, so I look at it first off, that cable bill just helps keeping things real. To me, we have that number, the PL is a number on the screen. We are not doling out the dollar bills every single day for losses that we're taking. So finding ways to feel the sting of a loss is really important mm -hmm. to me. Recognizing uh, things in terms of your opportunity costs is one of the hardest things to do as a trader, and it cuts both ways. I just want to, like, on the flip side, kind of talk about an experience that I have. The most difficult thing for me to ever do when I was trading on a prop firm was to go back there, to be able to get back into the game after I would have a month, right? And you realize that you just had a month where you worked your ass off, you were there, all day, you know, things were, I was trading bonds, so things were trading overnight and stuff like that. And at the end of that month of work, you are less financially well off than if you had just taken it off and gone and hang out in Mexico or just watched Netflix all day. You so know? frustrating. And it is. That, I think sometimes with the larger picture, putting it in terms of real things can sometimes, it's a tough psychological hurdle to get over. 100%. So, you know, that's what makes this so hard. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that just kind of touched on the fact, we, one of the things we have written here, is trading is uncertain. If you're getting into trading, you have to come in knowing this is not a nine to five, paid every other Friday, first and 15th, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. You have to recognize that. And to continue that aspect of it, if you're coming from a nine to five job, trading is not going to provide those those paychecks that you've been getting regularly, they're not gonna build up right away. You have to keep that in mind, recognizing how long it took you, if you wanna come into this to replace that income, how long did it take to get to where you are today to be making that income? And then understanding that, okay, trading, it's not gonna cover everything on day one. I have to grow into this. It's going to take some time. It may take a few years of sustaining mm -hmm. to start to see those, pros those profits really coming in and covering yourself. And then over time, you'll start to reap some of those rewards. Your trading is your business. And in the business world, it's not unusual for a new business to lose money for the first year. Yeah, they call it burn rate. Yeah, look at Uber. They don't yeah. even know when their burn rate's going to end. Ten years later, I mean, like, <laughs> what do they say about that? Uh, like, uh, we'll make it all up in volume, even though the margins are negative or whatever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all big Uber fans. Well. Yeah, that's uh, great, guys. So as far as consistently getting week consistent weekly profits, which is something Mick goes for, mm -hmm. the three bullet points we talked about today is focusing on the process, all right, keeping things realistic, mm -hmm. and then identifying your goals and adjusting the way you trade to be in alignment with that. Being alignment, being aligned with things is important in everything you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one fourth bullet point, cable bill. Just keep that one. You know, uh, <laughs> level two <laughs> says that he pays forty bucks for his internet in uh, Trinidad, which seems pretty nice. I yeah, think maybe we should just head down say. to Trinidad. I'm ready. I don't know, I, I guess taxes are probably pretty low there. <laughs> uh, I don't know, perhaps. <laughs> Level uh, two, we're on our way. Outstanding, probably better weather too. Ooh, this is just fun. Do we like Tesla? Uh, random question? Yeah. Yeah, why not? Keeps going up. 
right? <laughs> yeah, we love it at 200. <laughs> right? I think you went level two year long at 255, so uh, that's not too shabby. Nice. Affo afford a few uh, Netflix subscriptions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Dan, do you have a quote for us today before we sign off? I do. This one comes from The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Um, I really like it. I think the guy's got a great story. Um, but success isn't always about greatness. It's about consistency. Consistent hard work then leads to that success. Greatness will come after that. That's great. And uh, one thing for Trader Sue can learn from The Rock is I watched a great video from him where he explained that the best thing that ever happened to him was getting cut from a Canadian football team. And at the time it happened, it was the worst thing that happened to him. He right. played football his whole life. That dream was over. Mm -hmm. But everything like that opens a new opportunity. And that's not like corny, <laughs> motivational <laughs> BS. I mean, it kind of is, but it's definitely true. You can't just give up. I just Absolutely. looking at something today. It said, uh, if you find yourself in a dark place, it may just mean you're planted. Mm. I like that. Right? And then, you're and then ready you, to grow. Then you grow. Ready to grow. Well, next our... week on uh, Psychology Corner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> next week we're gonna like talk psychology. Hey, right? it's what uh, we've heard our traders like from the survey. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So anyway, uh, tune in next week for another episode of the Coach's Playbook. I think we're back on the regular schedule, so it'll be 11.30 on Wednesday. Absolutely. Thanks for stopping by and bring your questions. We'll try and get to them as it goes. I'm uh, bad at reading things sometimes, but I promise it's not out of neglect. Uh, <laughs> you guys are great. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next week. Absolutely. Don't forget uh, Market Recap this afternoon at 3.15. Make sure you guys are there. John and I had a ball yesterday taking on all those questions. Ran a little long. so yeah, it was a good time. But it was worth it. I had a lot of fun. So make sure you guys keep tuning in there, bring in on the questions. Yes. Cool. And don't forget, trade well. <laughs>